Margot Vigent, and I'm here in Bucknell's flagship makerspace, the 7th Street Studio, to tell you about BFAB, the Bucknell Fabrication Workshop. In this workshop, we teach you about various makerspace technologies and the pedagogy to use those technologies to do cool things with your courses. This is the first video in a series of three on teaching with the makerspace. By the end of this series of videos, you should be equipped with the tools to do your own cool project with your students in your campus's makerspace. You ready? Let's get to it. In this first video, we are going to look at what making is, how the makerspace works, and why you should think about it. So first up, what is making? We consider making to be a iterative process where something is created. Often it's a physical thing, but it doesn't have to be a physical thing. Um, incorporating high-tech tools, but not always, through a series of what Michael Landy and Sean Jordan call additive innovation. Making is inherently collaborative. It happens with and among other people, it builds on what has gone before, and it shares uh, what has been created. And making might describe something that's 3D printed, or making might describe something that is sewn, or it might describe something that is coded. All of this is fair game. So, now that we know what making is, where is it that making happens? Well, making usually happens in a makerspace. And a makerspace, in many people's minds, is a place with high-tech tools. And that's true. A nice makerspace, such as Bucknell's space at the 7th Street Studio, the Bucknell Makery, or the Mooney Lab, has such tools as laser cutting, 3D printing, vacuum forming, and uh, other tools to create electronic devices and test them, for example, among many other tools. And you can see some of these tools here over my shoulder as we look at the uh, laser cutter and some of the 3D printers available here in the 7th Street Makerspace. But beyond just those tools, a makerspace is also a place that embodies the ethos I just mentioned of collaborative innovation. So we have things like couches and inspiring posters and other symbols that show that this is a welcome place for you to hang out and get your work done and do what you want to do. There's uh, a variety of ways to make a baker space. There is no one right true maker space. Lots of places have a maker space that is just a room with some tables and a whole bunch of simple prototyping tools like boxes of cardboard and twist ties and scissors and glue. Um, some have high-tech spaces, but a key to the success of both making and a space is it has to be a place where people can form community and feel they belong. So this doesn't want to be something that's only open between certain hours. It doesn't want to be something that's only open to people um, who have uh, certain credentials. We want this to be open to a community and for a community to grow here. That's not to say you shouldn't have safety rules and training, but that is to say those rules and training should be as open as possible to allow uh, folks low barrier to initial entry. So why do people get involved in making? And this may uh, come into play in your own class and in your own philosophy. I like to characterize people's interaction with making according to three different t-shirts. Uh, one is kind of this initial uh, do-it-yourselferism, classic old school, why should I buy a thing when I can make that thing? And this works pretty well with engineering education, which is where I come from. Um, it's about self-reliance and self-independence and really getting a grip on how the world works. Another version of making is that this is the future of manufacturing. This is the future of small business. So it's very directed at producing products that people are gonna buy. So this also fits extremely well with uh, most engineering programs. 
we are going to prototype things that will then go on to be large manufacturing items. A final t-shirt, kind of related to the first, is making as an expression of independence. If you can't open it, you don't own it. We're going to use making to reclaim our tools. And you find that uh, making in terms of design, in terms of art, tends to go a lot with the first and the third t-shirt and a little bit with the center, whereas engineering, quite often we find people liking to live in the center. But all of these ideas can come together in your makerspace, where people can create, whether it's creating something for a gift, creating something for a class, or creating something just for the pure heck of it. So let's focus on learning for a moment. We are specifically looking at how a makerspace works in a uh, educational setting. And when you are using a makerspace in an educational setting, that is inherently part of active learning. So this is a graphic I like to use describing what I call the continuum of active learning. From We have from very teacher-centered uh, over on one side in the yellow, and in fact the in extreme of teacher-centered, which isn't even active, where it's just someone giving a lecture, all the way over to what I call the warmer colors, where we have um, more learner-centered classrooms. And up to the top, if you hit pause for a moment and zoom in and look at all of these, we're not going to talk about all of these here, we're just going to talk about one. I have low-tech ideas uh, for active learning across this continuum uh, in the gold and red colors up top. And then I have aligned ideas in the cooler colors, in the blue and the green, on the bottom for things that uh, leverage technology to accomplish this active learning. And you will see, looking here, there we go, circling it, we have uh, problem-based learning or project-based learning or even product-based learning in the makerspace. So this tends to be a very active uh, interaction for your students, and it tends to be very student-centered uh, because they are creating something that is their own thing. So if you are looking for a nice way to get PBL into your courses, using the Makerspace can really help with that. In fact, we here at BFAB strongly believe that making is an empowering tool that not only furthers your educational objectives, technical objectives within that class, but empowers students to take control of their own learning, their own self-expression, and uh, can even help them with their career directions. People have made all sorts of interesting stuff in class, whether it be pure art um, or something that then is both art and turns into a business or something that expresses ideas important to the course material in ways that just could not be expressed otherwise. We have images here from uh, Maker Fair uh, and from our classrooms. So let me get you uh, with a couple of important uh, definitions right now. One thing that we will keep coming back to in BFAB pedagogy is focus on learning objectives. What is it that you really need the students to walk out of this course knowing? And we always come back to that because, well, if you don't have a direction, it's hard to get to where you want to be. Problem-based learning, which you've heard me refer to already, is a inductive learning approach where we start with a problem, like a challenge that's in the world, and then the things that are uh, technical content about the class flow naturally from the students learning how to engage with that problem. So a traditional uh, instructional approach might be that I stand up in front of the room and I derive conservation of mass from first principles for fluid flowing in a pipe. And then I do it uh, in XYZ coordinates and then I do it again in radial coordinates. An alternative to this might be that I use problem-based learning and say to the students, uh, I need you uh, 
This is a project used by uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Erin Jablonski, when she teaches fluid mechanics. I need you to develop a gray water system that can recycle water for additional uses that is coming out of one of the campus dormitories. Well, they're certainly going to use ideas of conservation of mass in fluid flow as they are solving this. But now they have a motivation and a context and perhaps even a prototype they might build in addition to uh, eventually getting to deriving and using that equation. So you'll also note that I'm going to say PBL most of the time, and that's because P could stand for several different things. Uh, Problem-based learning is what I just described. It's got similar cousins, where you say project-based learning, which tends to be more limited, uh, slightly more limited about a particular project whose steps you are going to go through, or product-based learning, where the students are very focused on creating a new uh, item. We like to look at this in terms of the technology readiness scale, that uh, product is things that are uh, really close to uh, being created and being out in the world, whereas problems are big ideas that lend themselves to thinking more about theory. Uh, but any way you look at it, it's active learning and the makerspace can help you do it. Finally, for this section, I hope you are excited about problem-based learning and the possibilities for it within a makerspace. But you may have this nagging voice in your mind that says, yeah, but are the students still going to learn if I do this? And I am here to tell you, yep, we got literature citations that show you that students still accomplish their technical objectives, but they pick up so much more in terms of motivation, in terms of self-directed learning, um, in terms of connections between theory and practice. Please go check the literature if you are a, a doubter or contact us. We'll happily send you a bunch of papers. But believe us, this is a good way to accomplish what you need to in class, along with getting at some really uh, nice affective outcomes. That's it for this first video, where we introduced makerspaces, making, and why you might use it in class. Our next video gets into some specific examples of how the makerspace works in class.